Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. I'm really pleased to be continuing the conversation around the latest advances in machine learning, particularly around generative AI and today we're going to be focusing quite a bit on knowledge graph technology and how that kind of plays into the ecosystem and the architecture that we're, we're looking to build. And so I am pleased to be joined by another panel again. You'll notice there's three of us, there will hopefully be four. Charles has got a little bit stuck in traffic on the way into London, the joys of doing in person rather than uh, Zoom recordings. Let's kick off with some, some intros, although you'll recognise some faces if you are watching the previous uh, episode on the kind of general risks and challenges around building generative AI powered applications in, in enterprises. Hi right, everyone, well, I'm Chris Booth, product owner for Machine Learning uh, and OS Group. My primary focus is uh, looking at emerging technologies, creating prototypes and proof concepts to, on, uh, to bring value to the to bank. Specifically, I specialise in conversation AI and help manage the uh, Quora artificial intelligent agent portfolio. Hi, I'm Tony Seal um, and I'm a software developer. Uh, I've been specialising in doing uh, knowledge graphs for investment banks for the last 10 years or so now. Uh, recently then have been looking to combine that with large language models. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been great to have you join us Tony because we've really appreciated the posts you've been putting on LinkedIn on the topic. Um, so yeah, do go and check those out if you haven't already. I should say at this point, before we go any further, uh, as pretty much always, Architect Tomorrow is a personal podcast. It's our own personal views, uh, the views of the community, um, not those of our current or previous employers. Last time we were talking about the kind of components and the attributes that we needed in, in enterprise architecture for machine learning, we talked about a lot of the risks and the challenges and some of the technical challenges. And one of the interesting things, um, I, think, I think we'll probably go on to talk about this a little bit, Chris, is some of the ways we've used knowledge graphs practically to kind of mitigate some of the failings, I suppose, all the challenges that, that large language models and generative AI presents. But before we kind of get into all that, Tony, you're the expert in the space with over 10 years of uh, of, of knowledge. I just wondered if you could perhaps just give us a bit of a you know, 101 for those that have not really you know, come across knowledge graphs before. I mean, I, I did a bit of digging and I saw that yeah. Google in 2012 introduced the kind of Google knowledge graph, which is when you do a Google search, you get that sort of nice information box on the right hand side, that's powered by a knowledge graph. But perhaps give us the sort of 101 for those that have not come across a knowledge graph. Sure. Well, so maybe a good way of thinking about it is um, it's a different way of structuring the data. So we're, at the moment we're kind of used to seeing data in tables, in relational databases, and Excel spreadsheets. Uh, and like if you're a developer, then you're used to seeing uh, in XML files or JSON files. Those are like tree-like structures. And the graph structure is a different structure um, where we basically have nodes and then we connect them with edges. Um, and with a knowledge graph, what we do is we have uh, three uh, elements that let us do that. So for instance, I could have you as the subject mm -hmm. and then I could have the eye color as the uh, predicate and then uh, I could have blue as the, the value within that. And the funny thing is, if I then said, well, here is another subject and you guys are friends and, and, and uh, now we've got a link there. And Amazingly, with that you can basically create a, uh, a graph. Uh, and then, interestingly, um, with the knowledge graph stuff, uh, you can actually use um, URIs in order to be those identifiers. So uniform resource in identifiers. identifiers yeah, you, that's yeah. right. Yeah, you could just call them URLs, really, because uh, actually it makes sense that when you go to one of those URLs, it's actually resolvable over HTTP. That it turns out to be quite important. Yeah. But the interesting thing there then is that you can take your knowledge graph and you can distribute it out over the cloud. So right. um, now all of your data does not need to be co-located all into one place, but this can be a graph of interconnected data that is distributed on the cloud. And so is this essentially the kind of semantic web made real? Because uh, there was a lot of chatter about semantic web. Did that term just sort of fall out of favour and it's quietly kind of been happening behind the scenes? Yes, it? It, it's the same thing yeah. that's kept, oh, the semantic web is dead, oh, <laughs> now it's going to be called linked data, right. and now it's called knowledge graphs. Right. It, it just, it, it kind of won't, it won't die. And <laughs> because, I guess, the Because it's actually a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's a bit like uh, with the large language models, neural nets, oh, they don't work, it's, you know, <laughs> actually, no, that's a good idea, you just needed the compute now. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the things that caught my eye is when you spoke about JSON-LD, so JSON linked data, um, and so I guess is that sort of the pinnacle now where we've got to the sort of semantic web type technologies using 
link data to kind of represent things that allow us to connect up and make relationships between things in the enterprise, is that, is that kind of where we're at? Yeah, what I find particularly interesting about JSON-LD is um, there can be a thing with graphs that they're very complicated. Oh, you know, this, you know, I understand where I am with the relational database, I understand where I am with JSON, but graph, that kind of sounds like kind of scary. And uh, JSON-LD really kind of sorts that out for you because it um, means that you can just put your data in plain old JSON mm -hmm. and then you can have a couple of attributes at the top to say, you know, this is the context, this is where my kind of schema is going to be and this, is what, this attribute ID is going to let me put the URLs, uh, bring those into the picture. And then suddenly any developer who is able to write JSON is able to produce fragments of a graph, and they have. So mm -hmm. now over 40, I think it's like 44% uh, of all web pages on the web, and you know, like this is the point that I always want to hammer home to people. This is now a widely used technology. So, right. you know, and, and these are, this is not like rocket scientists or anything like that. They're web developers, skilled, excellent, very, very uh, highly rated web developers who are trying to optimize themselves in the search engine, when they're putting their HTML pages out there, they're including in that, within there, like here's a little bit of data, here's a little nugget of data about... Uh, when you mentioned briefly, um, like some people will find it a bit more complex or difficult relative to SQL or relational, how much of that is just habit familiarity? And how much is it like actual, it is more complex? From my personal experience, yeah, it took, your head, it took a while to get your head around the different structuring of, of the data with, with the graphs and over the edges, but once I've done that recently, I found I actually managed to traverse and understand and build graphs quicker than I do SQL. Yeah. Because of the very nature it's, of it. It's, uh, I agree with you. For me, it's actually more intuitive. It's closer yeah. to how I, I think, think, you know, if, you, if I was to go to a whiteboard and try and, mm. we were trying to swap an idea, then you end up drawing something pretty much like keys, a graph, you've yeah. got then you've got to kind of force it into yeah. its structure. Yeah. Yes, it's very unnatural. It's much, it's much, it's a much lower level uh, structure really, where we we had to worry about performance. And obviously, you still do need to worry about performance. Performance yep. matters, but basically, yeah, we can push that down to a lower level. Uh, so what do you think is the main stick push down from the then, or maybe some people prefer have, have graph brains, some people have. Relational brains, <laughs> but it is relationships. It's just it's just sort of representing them in a different way, right? I mean, I think relational databases have always been about relationships between things, but it's been, like, say, a bit artificial to think about things in a tablet because that's just not how we work, think yeah. about the world. They, yeah, there's the irony there. They, they call it relational databases. It's not. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, the relationship is not actually made of first class. Yeah, it's true. It's just the keys. It's the relationship. The keys of them. That's yeah. it. and then yeah, yeah, yeah. the irony. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, look, um, the reason Chris and I are really keen to talk about this is that we've done, we've done some work together, actually, we've done a bit of a proof of concept. Uh, if I can get the okay, maybe what I'll do is, is uh, overlay, uh, in a minute, uh, uh, into the you know, post edit, I'll overlay some of the demo of, of what we've done. But, um, It'd be very interested to hear about that. If, yeah, so let's talk about that say. a little bit. Yeah, so um, we, were, we were working with, uh, with Chris, uh, and we were kind of you know, doing some joint R&D around these uh, large angle models are great at kind of creating conversational content, but how would you use them in a highly sort of regulated sort of sector? Uh, how could you control them, stop them going off the, off the deep end and sort of talking about anything? So one of the, uh, my colleagues in London actually came up with a really nice ontology that represents a conversation and the objectives of a conversation. Oh, and so uh, hopefully also we can share that, actually to get sort of the thumbs up and we'll, we'll, we'll share that. I think it's really, I would say it's the finished product, but what it does is it essentially has the, the, the it's, it's essentially a graph of a conversation and the outcomes that you want to sort of drive and the sort of data points that you'd like to know in that conversation. And so the beautiful thing though about the algorithm is we then take that and we look at what's the weakest connection on that graph. And we sort of cycle through it. And that's then what's used to drive the prompting for the LLM to ask the, the user the next question. So, you know, it could be, um, we don't know, you know, basic information about the customer, so we need to kind of get some basics filled in on that graph. Or it could be, we, you know, the example is actually a financial health check example, so we need to know their sort of outgoings or their income. Um, so that's the sort of piece of information we need to detect. And then the, the, the other thing that the demo will show is, as this sort of conversation is happening, the graph is kind of getting built out. And it, the beautiful thing, of course, about the LLM is it doesn't have to be precise that, you know, it's exactly this pounds, shillings, and pence. You know, it's, it'll, it'll pick up talking about you know 
500 quid or you know, talking about it conversationally like you would do as a human being, but it's managing to extract that and put that information into the graph along, alongside the kind of conversation that's happening. So that's a proof of concept that I'd love to see sort of people sort of see and, and hopefully it's, it's useful. Um, and that, that, that kind of sparked the whole conversation about what are the things we need to kind of put around the edges of, of some of these generative technologies, because they're very exciting, but let's face it, unless you're building something that's very B2C, very consumer oriented, where the risk is low of getting something wrong, if you're in a highly regulated sort of market, then you're going to need to sort of think quite carefully about what this thing is doing for your brand or any of the other things we talked about in the last episode. So yeah, it's, it's exciting that we, it didn't take us actually that long, it took us a few weeks really to kind of get it's that amazing, isn't right. it? Yeah, the speed is Because the building blocks are there. So uh, that's what's exciting for me is that yes, there's a lot of hype around generative AI, but actually the thing that gets me excited is when we combine this with other technologies that are more mature. Uh, that's when I think we'll start to see some really, really interesting things happening in the business space. I think we'll see all kinds of crazy stuff, say, in the consumer world, you know. We've seen Lenzo, you know, we all sort of have a play with that. But I think when it comes to actual practical, you know, enterprise applications, you know, integrating it with your, your integration uh, platforms, you know, knowledge graphs that we're talking about. Just D, is just a huge potential here. So what excited me to tell you about your post the other, a while ago, I guess, probably a couple of months ago now, um, was sort of the idea of using JSON-LD because then you're putting, for your enterprise data, because then potentially you're putting the data in a similar sort of format as, because to your point earlier, the common crawl data set that these large language models are built on is built on a lot of semantic web data which has JSON-LD in it. So it kind of made absolute sense when you were saying get your organization's data into the same sort of format. I mean, yeah, can you talk a bit more about sort of that sort of concept. Yeah, and I'd like to drill into some of the, because I, yeah. I, I made some notes while you were talking sure. there, and you brought up the, the O word, the ontology right. uh, word, so that, that I think maybe for the benefit of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the audience, we probably, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably, probably should kind of drill into yeah. that, and I think that'll fit into the Jason LD thing a bit mm -hmm. as well. So. Um, the ontology is the kind of like is this the, the kind of semantic part of the semantic web. So um, there, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, extract out the abstract concepts, if you like. So um, not at the level of the individual data, but the kind of schema of the data. It's mm -hmm. the metadata part, yeah. part of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, and out on uh, with the, the JSON LD, then that is provided by schema. Uh, dot org. So that's where a bunch of big search engines all got together and said, well, you know, okay, let's create a ontology, a model of the various things that people talk about on the web. So, right. you know, this is a shop, this is a, this, I've got this product. That must be pretty comprehensive. Pretty, really? Yes, it, it's, it, it, it's big and flat. Like, okay. if, you, if you kind of go and speak to um, a professional ontologist, uh, you know, they will say it's the worst ontology, that, you know, it's not... Because it's, it's too flat and not... It's, it's not very flat, it's, yeah. Right. It's, I don't think I've ever heard someone say, that's a good ontology. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that also is very true, unless the person wrote the ontology themselves. Yeah, it turns out, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, what it is is widely adopted, so that you just absolutely can't, um, that, that you can't deny. So um, when all of these people are... Um, saying this is a customer, this is an airline, this is a flight, this is a product, then they are all referencing back to that same common model of what it is. Right. So that's 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 powerful right there. So then what you've done in your own way is you've developed you're saying an ontology about what a conversation mm -hmm. is. So this is the agent, this is the yeah. uh, these are the outcomes. These are the outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. So at that kind of abstract yeah. level and an, an important understanding is really any, any, and I would say every business should be about this now. Like, what are the concept? What are the words that we use to talk about our business? Mm -hmm. Let's get those and let's get them into an ontology. And then you talk about uh, schema.org and the large language models. But so, what, what I say here, and it's, this is a relatively controversial point of view, but I, I do think there is logic in it, as you were pointing out. Don't re reinvent the wheel, mm. kind of use schema.org as your uh, basis. Why do that? Well, because there's already, it's already been widely used out schema there. Schema.org's ontology is basis. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so like take your version of customer, and the nice thing about ontologies and graphs and stuff is we've got inheritance in there, so you can just extend that out to okay. add on your own properties on top of what their customer is. I mean, 
one of the key messages that I that I'm trying to spread out at the moment by doing these things. The AI revolution is happening. Like well, what that that I've been talking about this for quite some time. I know that a lot of other people have as well. There's an exponential curve for this thing. It is coming. It's now even beginning to bleed out into the publish mm -hmm. uh, consciousness. Every business needs to be consolidating their data. So yeah. that's I've said it before that we're basically we look we look on at the uh, tech companies. Oh my God, they're doing all this incredible stuff. But each individual organisation is like a beggar sitting on top of a gold mine of all of the information that they have collected over all of the years. They've got all the experts there who really understand what their domain is, but it's in a mess. Yeah. It's it's all over the place. It's fractured and fragmented yeah, in all of these. Right. You can't. You not. I mean, maybe one day we, we train an AI that's kind of powerful enough that you Go just and clean that open, open up the bottle and, and out it goes and sorts it out. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and who knows, one mm. day that may happen, but I don't. it's not a good business strategy. To but there's a human way. problem that you still have to get over, right? Even if the AI can restructure your data, your human processes and other things need to change to kind of be compatible with that. I mean, it's interesting to sort of hear you talk about this sort of business, that you kind of agree your business ontology or agree your business terminology because it feels like that would solve so many different things in the organisation anyway, right? I mean, like knowledge management challenge, for example, I'm talking about widgets, you're talking about items or SKUs. It's just silly things like that where enterprises sort of trip over themselves because they've got so big that they can't have that, you know, um, conversation around a table like we're having now to agree terminology. You need that set of agreed terms and I think there's a, actually a bunch of reasons why finally getting on top of data and taking it seriously. Because I think you're right, the difference between the tech startups and the incumbents predominantly is the fact that the tech startups have come up this green field and they're able to build cleaner data architectures and cleaner cloud architectures and, uh, and mm -hmm. circular architecture mm -hmm. here. But um, that, for me, is the fundamental difference. People get sort of um, scared by sort of tech disruption, but that fundamentally is just the fact they've come at this with a blank sheet of paper. Are you aware, it might, it might, it might be, it sounds like schema is, schema.org is the leading the way. Is there any efforts to create one ontology to rule them all? <laughs> well, is that what as much as, as schema, like schema basically schema.org is that. And then well, it's as close as we, as we have at the moment. It's as close as right. we have at the moment, and it, uh, a, a kind of 40% coverage within within the web, it would be there. And and also that tends to be the one that people are going to mm -hmm. in order to like extend. So for, for instance, within the financial domain, we've got Fiverr, which is the, okay. the, the, the business ontology for, mm -hmm. for finance. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's a kind of lightweight offering of that, which is included within schema.org. So depending how you want to go deeper. Or schema.org will have a notion of uh, data set and data catalogue in it, but then if you want to go kind of deeper on that, then there's the decan on top. Why haven't they merged or one together? the other? I suppose it's hard to subjectively say one's a better ontology than the Well, I think the way that it's going to go is that you will get detailed business aligned ontologies and then you will kind of get these kind of like wider broader ontologies so schema.org is a wider broader ontology mm. and then you can create mappings between and that's what uh, we found right two. is like for specific use case you're going to have to Perhaps you guys, your ontology starts taking off. You create the detailed ontology conversation around, around, yeah. around and, yeah. and I think probably we could do with something like that. It sounds mm. like a useful thing. Conversation for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. So maybe that's what you end up doing, and you go really deep on that. But I would say that when you do it, have a chat to the schema dot all guys. Right. Do, a, do, yeah. a, do a pull request from there. Get the the line. Yeah. Use put, those. Put, yeah. Put, your, yeah. put a put a lightweight Cause, version. Because what strikes me about sort of schema dot is, I guess it's it's born out of search engine optimization broadly. I mean, like I'm, yeah. I'm massively simplifying. I appreciate probably skipping over a whole load of yeah. really good work that people will blame me in the comments for now. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I guess my point here is that we're now entering other applications for graph structures which need sort of a different alignment. So, uh, what started life the schema August internet search for me. Where I'm coming at this is kind of human behaviour. So we talked about conversation, but like you need something that sort of encapsulates kind of human behaviour characteristics if you want to sort of interact with human beings and, and know how what's appropriate, what the guardrails are perhaps around. Because the thing that's fascinating me, and I'm possibly straying a little bit off the topic here, is it's kind of where I wonder whether the graph will not only be uh, key for the sort of language understanding, but I'm sure there'll be graph structures for behaviour and other things. I think this is a great segue into something else you've posted, Tony, of uh, the intention mechanism, how similar it is to the graph. Yeah. 
so some controversy over that. So, but but yeah, let, let's let's maybe even um, backtrack uh, even a little bit further from that, and let yeah, let's talk about like text and data. So at the moment, we've got this idea of like I have structured data, and that's what most of us enterprises have a lot of structured data. Mm. Got all these databases mm. full of all this uh, yep. data. We've also got kind of a lot of internal documents that are, that are kicking around, and then and 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 then out on the web, there's the web of documents. We've got all all of this text, and that's called unstructured data. But you you run a large language model over the top of uh, that unstructured data, and of course it's it's not unstructured. There's the rich semantics of a natural language. There's everything, all of the intentionality of the people. Um, and with a big enough uh, neural net and deep enough neural network, it turns out that actually you're able to learn a lot of that structure, and you're able to get a bit of a kind of world model going mm, on there right. uh, as well. And then on the other side, the structured data, as we were talking about before, that doesn't need to be any longer trapped into these kind of boxes of this is the relational data. Now we've got this rich structure of a graph, and obviously a graph is just a type of network. A neural network is also a, a network. Basically, we're, t we're talking about quite yeah. suddenly we have these kind of like similar uh, structures. So then the question is, well, can we take the structured data and the unstructured data, and and what can we do to bring these two things into harmony uh, with each other? And I think that's very much something that's being worked out at the moment. But so let's perhaps talk through like some of the ways uh, that that can be done and the first one would be like I'm just doing ground truths mm -hmm. so like one of the things I've experimented with is you ask a question into chat GPT uh, and but you say give me your answer back in a JSON LD graph so okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's seen it's seen so much uh, JSON LD out there already it, mm -hmm. knows it, it knows it very well right it does the entity recognition uh, within there yeah, I see that you're talking about Microsoft here and you're talking about blah 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 and then it gives you back that in a JSON LD oh, graph right. and then if you kind of pin it down and say well okay look when you're identifying Microsoft I'd like you or, or any company or any entity that you recognize use their website as, as the URI, or use like one of the open source, uh, use their Wikipedia, mm -hmm. use the Wikipedia page about their yeah. entity. S straight away, then, what I can do is I can have my own information within my company, and I can use that like a Rosetta Stone to yeah. link every entity I know about <laughs> to the entities that are out there on the web. So then you've kind of got a general, your your go. So, so the way to see what the large language model is is a compression of the web. They basically taken all of the information on the web and they've, they've compressed it. Yeah. Um, so then I can put a question in and get a graph back. It can have well-known URIs to do the entities in. And then I can reach into my own company's data. And this is where the kind of JSON and LD comes in and having your own schema.org because if you've mirrored that structure, so that's the structure that's working out on the web, they've got a large language model, they've got JSON LD, it's completely there's there's no limit to the amount of information that you can put in there and link there. If your own internal uh, company structure has got the same thing. Now a graph has come back from the general knowledge of the web. I find all my kind of connection points in with any of my local data and I can now bring a whole bunch of data that I don't want to share with anybody else and merge those two together. Now I've kind of got this working memory graph basically that's representing... Um, and coming back to your point earlier, um, potentially getting your company data into that format, you could even use a large language model potentially to do that. Right. So I was about to ask, what's the what's the two links? Because I, I'm going to specify um, a model that I found recently where they did the actual embedding of the graph when fine tuning the model. But it sounds like you're talking about two services to an API in them. Or... Yeah. So 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 this is where this is where there's various ways of bringing these graphs right. together. So 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 we talk about there's kind of like a ground zero approach that you, when you say to the, the large language model bring me back my data, bring it back in a graph, use these well-known URIs in order to... Uh, uh, and, then, and, 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 and then I'm just going to use yeah. those as anchor points, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll, right. I'll connect into my... Mm -hmm. uh, anybody can do that, that's that's kind of like your, your, that's your kind of base one uh, level. Then you've got uh, vector embedding uh, databases, so um, you could basically take 
your company information. You can, you, you, you can take a, a you can create a, a vector embedding like per subject, for instance, uh, and yep. then you could. Uh, sorry, I probably should backtrack on, on a vector embedding. So. Um, when a large language model has, has, has compressed its information about the web, and when you hear about GPT being like you know a trillion uh, parameter or whatever, that is basically a long string of numbers. Mm -hmm. And that long string of numbers, you can think of it like a kind of coordinate in a way, in a naive sort of way. So if you imagine it was just two numbers, uh, it would take you to any point within a graph. And if you if you imagine it now like three numbers, then that coordinate is going to take you, uh, you know, up, up and down as well. Um, and basically, if you imagine every word now that it's learned to predict what's the next word that's coming in the sentence, and then I feed that word in now, that word is going to get one of these embedding vectors. And that's, those have been around for a long time. I could take the embedding vector that is king, and I can minus male out of it and plus female into it and then I'm going to say well what embedding vector is nearest to this one and it will right. take me to queen so I can add these numbers. This is the thing that took me the longest to get my head around is this sort of multi-dimensional relationship structure that's going on right that's what this vector is essentially it's kind of I'm sorry but anyway is this kind of linkage in multi-dimensional space of one thing to various other things and your point about compressing the internet is it's if you could think of if you could visualize the internet as lots of different sort of points that is essentially what's then kind of describing it, is it, it, yeah, and, and sort of compressing it. It's, but it, it, it's sort of mind-boggling sometimes if you look at some of these things for the first time. It's well, yeah. especially because like like OpenAI, like they they particularly point to one of their early papers about the sentiment neuron. So like you know, uh, they were just doing next word prediction, and then uh, they had a neuron that if you tweaked it around within there, then it's going to be either like positive or negative uh, sentiment based upon it. So the, indica the, the implication there is that some of these embeddings, they're, they're abstract, conceptual, world modelly mm -hmm. uh, neurons. And, and, and I think that uh, some people still argue with that. But to your point, that's why platforms like um, Elasticsearch and Pinecone are taken off again, mm -hmm. because the, these vector databases are proving so valuable to solve the the hallucination language model problem. Yes. Like I said, you can take your databases, uh, embed it every day when you update it, and then you've got a, a truth, a source of truth for the language model to stop. Yeah, you need to face off against the large language model, but is yeah, going to be op operable, with, interoperable with it, right? Yeah. So that's why I really like what Tony was saying around JSON LD. And I guess maybe it sounded controversial when you said it, but now, like looking back, maybe I kind of it feels like that's. Yeah, not not. I mean, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a bold. It was a bold thing to make at the time, but it kind of feels. Now you've explained it like that. Like that's just a very sense, a very sensible way to sort of look. Yeah. At. So well, so imagine the data. So so some of those conceptual understandings, one would be able to map back to schema.org, right? So where schema.org has got a, a concept in, that's modelled in schema.org, it's got a whole bunch of data examples out of there. It's got all the text that's surrounded about that sort of thing. So now, if I'm in my own organization and I've based my model off of schema.org's model and then I've got all of my own um, data items in JSON-LD that are pointing back to that and I can make connections for them by getting embedding vectors for those sort of things. It's like we're speaking the same language now. The main value being you can leverage just public information, so whether it's in finance, using the final example like what's inflation, that will be on the, the schema.org on the web and you can just pull that rather than have to store yourself? Well, it's more kind of knowing what the world is like, so you know, you can, you can just, oh, you, 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 can, you can say, you can just put in question. You can, you can put in questions that you would ask to a human and that kind of common sense understanding uh, of, of how the world works based upon the internet being put together, which is then mirrored with your Hardcore data grounded into your hardcore data. So I suppose you could pair them. Platform. You can you can do checks on your data as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so the the kind of vision I put forward to is <clears throat> every organisation behind its firewall, every all data everywhere ac accessible via this semantic layer. So yeah. you create this semantic layer which is based upon schema.org, but it's got all the specific terms of your business. And then you say to each application, you will publish, sorry, I know that you don't want to, but tough, 
you will publish your data in JSON-LD representing the data that you hold within that. This that feels system. very much like the Jeff Bezos memo, the immortal one, right, that says thou shalt service orientate or basically not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It think, kind of feels like maybe... I think it is a bit like that, but this, is, yeah. this, is, uh, this I believe, is the crunch moment in the, ex yeah. in, in the exponential curve. The conventional wisdom is that you can't have one of these shared models. It's simply too hard. Mm -hmm. Most of the banks have had a go at it at one point and they yeah. failed. But the difference now is, I think it's, it's motivation behind it. Fail, fail. You can't fail at this now. We, the, the luxury point of not having one definition of what your customer mm. is, or a base model of what a trade is, or a base model of a, yep. a track is. If you can't get your stuff sorted out, you are going to be in serious, serious mm. trouble. That's the just the general trend. I've seen data right? engineering suddenly that's get a lot more interest because. Everyone's wanting all these nice features and use cases, and they're like, but that's the garbage in, <laughs> garbage out. So yeah. you need to get your data sorted. And you see like these movements around data mesh, data contracts, and yeah. they're all they're all very good. But actually, guys, check out what's going out on the web. There's a model out there; it's working. Don't bother reinventing the wheel. Just take that, use it, and exactly. then extend it where there are specifics that you need to for your industry and for your particular organisation. But try and align it as much as possible to the outside world. So it's it's Makes makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where, where we're at now. Tony, I'm really interested to sort of get your take on where you see things headed, or are there things that are sort of really capturing, perhaps, yeah, perhaps we'll rephrase that slightly. Let's start by sort of looking at things that right now are capturing attention, and I'll ask you a little bit about where you see things going in the future. So what's sort of caught, caught your interest recently in this space? So what I'm super excited about at the moment is like the rise of these open source large language models. Okay. So, I was like, playing with some on the weekend. Actually. Yeah, and they're getting pretty good yeah. now, aren't they? Yeah. So like you've got like uh, the the uh, red power armor and stuff pajama and stuff like that. That uh, now we've got these open data sets. So what I would be really keen to see is why can we take one of those open source large language models, can we take these principles I'm talking about here and build that in from the start, like could we take Wikidata, partly train, uh, create a data set of, in red pyjama of like an output from Wikidata, train it on Wikidata, um, you know, uh, so that it, it, it would now we'd have a, we would now have a knowledge graph embedded within a large language model so some of the so anything that we can do to like sort of squeeze uh, the difference between these two worlds of like the text mm. and the uh, and, and the factual grounding yeah. you know can we take some of this can we take schema.org and do more of the um, can, can we uh, do more to train it there so I think that's quite interesting and then like this whole idea of um, ontologies and can we take something that's going on within the long, large language model and then relate that back to the ontology at the conceptual level? Can we zoom out from the conversation a bit like kind of what you're doing by the sounds of things by creating your ontology about mm. the conversation? Mm -hmm. It's sort of able to sort of do more, more structure, as I say. I think so. I think it is. I think it is. I think it is more structure, uh, and it's a bit like. Um, I think the human memory works this way. So if, if you think about like, uh, what do they call it? Like the uh, butcher on the bus. So you, 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 see a, you see a guy on the bus and one part of your memory is like, recognize his face from somewhere. You're on the kind of fuzzy part. So this is like okay. the, the large language model part now. You're, it's trained on fuzzy textual data. I recognize him, do I, is he a teacher at my kid's school? Is he a, and then the second part of your memory kicks in and goes, no, he's the butcher. That's where I recognize him yeah. from. So I think it's almost like uh, what we did was give another abstract layer of function or goal. So the, the, the weakness, or perhaps what we've identified with graphs, is yeah, it's good to put in this sort of structure and makes it easy to query, and there's like uh, some models are better, like recommendation models, but it kind of just exists. What we were looking at is more um, to that point, like what can we do with that? How can you actually manipulate the graph to make it more um, useful? Um, yeah, that was more of a random thought. I think you've just made two points click together on <laughs> with the butcher example. Yeah, so that's so that that's how human memory works, and I think maybe we can uh, we can start to move to something similar with these things. Uh, the other way of thinking about it is like that thinking fast and slow thing. Mm. So again, it's like you've got the large language model. It's got this world knowledge, it's trained on text. 
and then we've got the kind of ground truth facts, yes. which, which you need which, for the... Which is exactly why I was saying I think we need to integrate this. This thing is a component of the broader system we're trying to build, and that, that sort of thinking slow piece is the kind of organisational history and data and other things, and integration architecture with perhaps the latest feed of market data or customer information, customer events, whatever. Those sort of things need to be sewn alongside the bit that's processing the, you know, the, the language component. I'm sure it will change when these models, like say in the future when these models exist that have other features wrapped around them, I'm sure they'll be even more powerful. But for me at the moment, it feels like you need to sort of cook up the right blend of, of, of pieces to make this work well. Yeah, and quite a few people seem to contact me who are working in the biomedical space because okay. they are like taking all of, like there's a big effort on at the moment to kind of take all of the scientific papers and then, you know, somehow the large language model get increase the knowledge that's there on this on this kind of scientific stuff so my message to all of those guys is, is just always at the moment where you've got already a rich set of ontologies which are human engineered kind of ontologies that have attempted to create a logically consistent uh, understanding of that mm -hmm. can you use those ontologies in concert with your large language exactly. models to uh, to kind of again kind of ground them out or to give us an example like what we were looking into so one of, the, one of the weaknesses of language models, especially in the conversation AI space, is um, they're, they're, they're stochastic parrots. So point being, you know, if you just say credit card or a word to them, how we humans think is what you're talking about, Chris, what do you mean credit card? Well, what's an language model just do a probability and just explain what credit like card credit, is. Yeah, exactly, credit card. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's what we figured grass would be really good for, is again, if you're, if you're missing context, that's how we human brains work to go, okay, well, what are the nodes that I'm missing? I need to fill those in. Um, and that function, then you can feed that back language model and do that level of compression there. Um, it seemed to work. Yeah. So I think that's the, to your point, exactly that. It's not just, not just information extraction, but you can actually put functions in the graph to make the language model um, uh, work more effectively. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and now imagine an organisation that has basically established its semantic layer, has got all of its applications publishing their, the key parts of the data they hold into that semantic layer, has maybe done trained its own large language model, obviously at great expense, but taken one of the base models, done a customization over all well, you of say it. that, but the, the open source demonstration is it's coming down yeah, it's coming fast. Down. Mm. Yeah, 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 no it is. So you take all your documents, to map your documents into the kind of semantic layer as well. So now you're basically training it on all of your documents, you train it on, uh, you ground it into your actual data as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then it doesn't seem inconceivable that you, 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 you've got a, a window where you say, oh, I want to do X, Y, or Z, no, no, and, and bang, it's well, got all the data, it's got all the, the documents. the agent functions like auto HTTP have demonstrated where yeah. the language model can act as a task manager. But that's that's why I've been looking recently. Yeah, and there you go. You've got, your, you've got an assistant that knows your bank. But, but kind of industry. ground one is yeah. is actually something really quite simple and unglamorous. And yes, you'll be able to use AI to help you do this process. But actually, it is just to get your data sorted out. Get you can download Schema.org from it's just open source. So that's my recommendation. Is download mm -hmm. download Schema.org and then start the painful process mm -hmm. of trying to get all of your you know really. It's going to need anybody watching this now. Um, you, you, you want to get some some way of getting to your chief executive and delivering them this message, which is that you know we need to be getting our data estate sorted out now. So we need to we need to get this downloaded and we need to begin this painful process. It's it's political. Yes, yeah. you know, it, it absolutely is. And my thoughts are going to canonical data models, right? Yeah. Which were a thing hated. Yeah, hated. it's possible, it's never going They're to work. Very difficult politically. Yeah. But this kind that of sounds like former time model those. Right? So canonical data models were um, an attempt to try and get organizations to have one sort of standard model that you would probably map business unit data into right. in reality. But so for example when you we have an integration bus or enterprise service bus type thing in the organization, you want one sort of standard set of terms or data sets going across that bus. So you can sort of publish and subscribe. So it's, it's kind of required really if you want to do event-driven architecture well, because in order to publish events and subscribe to events, you kind of need to have like an agreed business language. The trouble with it was is that 
you get each business unit going, well, no, my definition of trade or my definition of customer is the right one. So where I'm kind of, kind of coming to is this does feel like it's going to be quite a painful exercise. However, the point we were touching on earlier is there are, no, there are new tools at our disposal now, which is we can perhaps automate a lot more of that translation. Um, and, and perhaps you can have um, data sets that aren't aligned as long as you've agreed on what the standard terminology to schema org is, you can have something that perhaps on the fly is doing some of that translation, as long as you've agreed the mapping. So I think the problem we had with canonical data models was it was just an almost impossible task. And it felt very technical, like what's the purpose of doing, what's the business outcome? It was, sometimes that was quite difficult to sort of see. Mm. I think technologists, you know, enlightened architects and technology strategists could see where it could take the organization. The trouble is that perhaps wasn't solved very well. Hard so, yeah. Whereas now I think, to Tony's point, you kind of see this the, the, the potential of, of, of kind of the, the graph sort of structure and what it can do for you. This perhaps, you know, the lights will perhaps go on to go, right, I can see why we need to invest in our data, stewardship, governance. Well, the pitch is simply now you can make ChatGPT talk about your data. Yeah. Right, or you can we could do tasks on your data and that's it. It's yeah. Yeah. Gross yeah. implication, but that's yeah. That, yeah. That, is, that is essentially yeah. it, yeah. And, and really also uh, do or die. And I, so I, I hope. I hope that people do revisit that because in the the back of my head is this worry that basically what happens is a lot of people don't don't sort it out and then we just get this kind of like uh, wipe out of um, lose a load of diversity within the kind of economic system uh, which will because the tech sector and tech savvy organisations that get this right will yeah a few, that's a, few, a few early movers get right. in there get in, in every industry it could be like you know like one bank could do this mm -hmm. one whatever could do this they do it first the, the other guy yeah, has more the first advantage They're, because of the human aspect to it because of the changing culture that's going to require to do it it's mm. not yeah, okay, the AI is getting faster and faster. You can chuck all the AI at it that you want if you can't get people to kind of agree and collaborate uh, and can get the structures going, then um, it's not going to happen. And for those that it doesn't happen for, I just I don't see how they're going to see Yeah, that. I fully agree. It's very similar to the whole singularity argument of the problem with this AI technology is before large organisations could feel comfortable not being first mover because they could catch up. But that's not really the case. Bill of singularity, if you're first, you win. There is, like... You're not just a second behind, you're, you're years behind at that point. Uh, that's only going to perpetuate as this technology. Again, we're entering, as you say, the this exponential curve of capability. Um, yeah, I completely guess that's my concern too. Is um, If you can imagine, like, I don't know, if you could build a financial coach or if everyone has their own personal financial advisor, I'd sign up to that bank in a heartbeat. Mm. And all of a sudden, like, if you're in a half year behind, you're not, they're not going to switch back. No, that's, no. Just, that's just one example of yeah. a huge diverse ecosystem. Like yeah. So, this has been a fantastic conversation. I suspect it was the things I'm sort of taking away, but I'd be interested in sort of your sort of final uh, thoughts, pair of you as well. Is that this is a genuinely uh, game-changing sort of moment, and it's not just that. Oh look, the computer can now understand and talk. <laughs> you know, talk our language. There's actually now going to be a whole bunch of other things that can be unlocked. Behind, behind this as well, so it's not this sort of one trick pony that you know is overhyped and, and, and then we sort of forget about. And then the second thing is, we go back to the importance of uh, you know good architecture essentially, which is good data, but also good change management around getting people on board with the journey, the mission to sort of become a more data you know driven organisation and really be good uh, data you know citizens when it comes to sort of you know managing our own data sets, steward, stewardship, and all that good stuff. So those are the things that I'm sort of Taking away, but Tony, I mean, where, where do you sort of where do you sort of see this? Uh, so, so where, what's your sort of thoughts on where this is headed? Um, yeah, so I, I see lots of I see lots of change mm -hmm. uh, going on. I see uh, rapidly evolving, you know, the the, the tectonic shape, uh, technical tectonic plates are going to be shifting around in a in a in a in a increasingly fast mm -hmm. spin. Um, and I think that through all of that kind of fancy stuff, I think the message should be to, to all organisations is just concentrate on the simple stuff. Get your data, get your data yep. organised, and get it in shape. Don't get, don't get, 
don't get too distracted. Don't by get too distracted by all of the whiz yeah. and everything that's going yeah. on. You've got one simple mission now. Yes, use yes, use the AI and pour it into that. But mm -hmm. you've got to get the message to your chief executive. The chief executive's got to realise that this is probably the most important thing for any organisation right now. Since the internet came along, perhaps. Yes, I mean Bill Gates. They said to Bill Gates. Um, where do you, you know, you were involved in the making of the PC and the internet. Where do you see this moment with GTP? Is it, where does it sit on that? And he's like, big, as big as, maybe bigger mm. than those. So as big, maybe bigger than the internet or the invention of the PC. And that's someone who would, would know. This is, this, is definitely, this is definitely real, and there's going to be a lot of movement going on in that. But, that, but in a way, to stick your blinkers down, Get your yeah. do something that seems kind of quite basic and boring, and and it's certainly going to be painful and politically awkward. Which is just get your get your semantic layer set up. So get your data and your documents nicely organised, mm -hmm. and then when all of this kind of plays through, you're in position. You've got you, a foundational you, you're, piece. You're in the go. Yeah. This is these are the crown crown jewels that you, you're sitting on. No one can take that away from you. It's your information. Know what's private, by the way. That's also a very important. Yeah, part of this. yeah, you know, yeah. Stuff. yeah. Don't yeah. let, let stuff leaking out earlier that shouldn't be leaking out because yeah. that you've got that you've got the experts you've got the data that you've built up lock that down get it organised get it consolidated and then you'll be able to layer the AI piece over the, the top. Yeah. Chris, I feel like I shouldn't add anything just to keep the message pure and simple. <laughs> Honestly, um, find the right people to do it. Yeah. Don't talk. Yeah. Like, yeah. I agree with the strategy, mm. In, implementing that is mm. also incredibly difficult, even mm. keeping it simple too. Uh, so, yeah, we, don't uh, maybe enough, we don't have enough people who know about this stuff, and there's some wizardry around it which is unnecessary. Sure. It's not actually as complicated as everyone. Well, that's there. why I was really keen to do this sort of mini series, really, is to kind of get, make sure the architect community understand quite how game changing this is. I mean, the, the thing is, sometimes folks in the enterprise architecture space and roles can be a little bit like, oh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen this thing, I've seen, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a bit of a, oh yeah, yeah, it's the next type thing. I think sort of pricking people out of that bubble to say, no, take, take this one a bit more seriously. It's not, it's not blockchain. It's, you know, it's not NFTs. <laughs> it's not Web3. It's not, well, it, ironically, and then for oh, yeah, notes, it is Web3, yeah. Web but the real version Semantic, of Web3, which is the semantic, semantic web. web. Yeah, so yeah. I, I hate the fact that the Web3 has been hijacked by, by people that are kind of trying to take it down a different path. For me, this is what Web3 is. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's the internet that's... Uh, compatible with machines as much as it's compatible with human beings. And with that, uh, I'll just thank uh, the pair of you very much. It's a shame Charles could make it. I'll perhaps get Charles' thoughts on this topic separately. Um, but uh, yeah, and if you aren't already um, subscribed, uh, do, do check out the Architect Tomorrow YouTube channel. We're also on various different audio podcast services. Uh, Tony here and Chris also have published some great blogs on LinkedIn, so do go and check those out if you haven't already. And with that, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for having me.